The rainy Sunday night of August the 12th, 1979, will remain embedded in the memory of a retired bricklayer named Jean until his dying day. Upon that Sunday at 10 minutes to 12, Jean swiftly drank his last vodka and tonic and left the public house in the district of Thingwall. He walked unsteadily through the heavy rain to his Ford Cortina in the pub car park, the worst for drink. He'd been drinking with friends at the pub since 7pm and now he was to embark on a journey home to Nocturum. After stalling the vehicle as he was leaving the car park, Gene put on his car radio. He restarted the engine and was soon travelling up Barnston Road. Not only was he drunk, Gene was also speeding along as the rain lashed down. He suddenly noticed the man in black standing at the roadside about 200 yards up the road. The figure looked like a policeman to Gene, so he slowed down and turned the radio volume down. The person standing at the roadside turned out to be a black man in a black suit and a black polar neck sweater. He raised his arm as Gene's Cortina approached. The high intake of alcohol made Gene feel quite charitable and he did what he normally would never do when he was sober. He stopped for a hitchhiker. Before Gene could even lean over to unlock the passenger door, the man in black entered the vehicle, yet the bricklayer was certain that door had been locked. The man slammed shut the car door and relaxed back into his seat. Where do you want to go? Gene inquired in a slurred voice. The roundabout up ahead, the stranger answered in a low voice, and he never even turned to face the driver. Gene fumbled the clutch control, and as the Cortina shuddered and moved off, the black man said, I have to pick up a child as well. Y you what? Gene muttered, confused. I'm death. The man turned at last to face Gene. Gene realised he'd let a man with a mental problem into his car and he immediately started to think of a way he could get rid of him. You die tonight, Gene, said the sinister black-clad passenger. And you kill a child at this roundabout. Gene stopped. He attempted to brake, but the car refused. The gear stick was locked in position and the steering wheel refused to turn a fraction of an inch. Gene swore and he kept trying to halt the vehicle in sheer desperation. The speedometer stayed at a steady 55 miles per hour. As Gene took his foot off the accelerator pedal, the car continued to move along at its constant velocity towards a junction. Beyond that was a stretch of Arrow Park Road, then the roundabout. Beads of sweat formed on Jean's face and forehead and a chill coursed through his body. It all felt like a nightmare, but one in which the dreamer cannot wake. He contemplated jumping from the vehicle and tried the door handle, but like the steering wheel, it refused to budge. The sounds from the car radio was no longer that of pop tunes, but dire organ music, which sounded like Chopin's funeral march. In the windscreen of the doomed Cortina, the faint images of two coffins materialised. One of the coffins was small, and Gene knew it was the coffin of the child he was about to kill in the accident. He let go of the wheel, and he turned to the man, who was undoubtedly the Grim Reaper, and he pleaded to be let off. What about my children? My wife and kids? Sobbed Gene. Not a trace of remorse was to be found in the poker face personification of death. He calmly said, at the back of your mind, you knew this would happen. You knew drinking and getting behind the wheel of a car would come to this one day, so you obviously think nothing of the people you're going to leave behind. Please, I'll do anything, Jean said, staring in dread through the swaying windscreen wipers at the dark road ahead. The ghostly coffins melted away to reveal the crying face of a little girl. Jean's heart palpitated. It was a seven-year-old daughter, Emily. When you die, your wife gradually gets over it and she marries again. The man she marries ends up beating her and he also abuses Emily. Emily starts drinking and she ends up as an alcoholic. Please let me have another chance, Jean begged. The Grim Reaper said nothing in return. In a resigned voice, Jean said, Is there an afterlife? The question was never answered. 
As the Cortina sped past Landacan Cemetery, the passengers suddenly said, Here it comes. Up ahead, several cars were swerving about the roundabout and heading to various exits. There was a little giveaway line ahead, but Jean's car was unable to stop. And as it hurtled towards the roundabout, three boys ran out of a field and raced across the road as part of a dare. The last boy was caught squarely in the headlights of the speeding Cortina and he turned and he froze in complete terror. Through the glare of the headlights, the boy thought he saw two people. The driver with his hands over his face and the passenger. No! Jean screamed. The hand of the passenger grabbed the wheel before Jean's eyes could register the action. The wheel was turned and within a fraction of a heartbeat, the car swerved and missed the boy by such a fraction of an inch, the wake of the Cortina gusted against him. There was a long, eerie sounding screech of tyres and the Cortina was suddenly coming to a halt along Church Lane, minus its supernatural passenger. Jean parked his vehicle and then got out. The rain had stopped and he started to walk home with a sober man. The three boys who had suicidally hurried in front of the Cortina ran after Jean. The boy who should have died under the wheel shouted, Nutter! As the late shock closed in, Jean turned to the lucky boy and he said, D Did you see a man in that car with me just then? Yeah, the boy uttered. He then called Jean a madman and other names, but his insults seemed to fall on deaf ears because the man who had almost ended his life walked away up the night street without a grunt of reply. Jean was so affected by the terrifying paranormal experience he gave the Cortina away. He broke down in tears when he reached his terrace home in Nocturum and told his wife about the encounter with death. She had never known him to lie or to hold the remotest interest in the occult, so she believed in his strange tale. Nowadays, when Jean has a drink, he makes sure a taxi takes him home.